So, uh, let's see here. Uh, so today's lecture will be uh, what I said here in my subtitle, how to generate a lot of connected elements. So as you have seen before, with a small number of elements that you have in your uh, assignment currently, it's easy to do by hand. But if you have larger finite element models, uh, you need to be able to generate models or elements in a more automated fashion. It's really hard to kind of sketch up an element from a geometry. So we will look at mesh generation. So as I said, for lower more, more complex problems, meshes need to be uh, created by algorithms. Uh, and there is a lot of algorithms available for generating meshes. Uh, many of these, they generate the, uh, have a geom ge geometric description as a base uh, from which it will generate elements. Uh, you can also set uh, constraints on the on the meshes. So, for example, that you want to guarantee that uh, all elements generated are less than a certain area uh, or a volume. Uh, you can also set uh, how many elements you want on a certain geom geometric line or entity, um, and it will generate that. It's also possible to uh, refine the mesh uh, from results that previously was generated. So uh, you you do have a coarse mess, mesh and your calculation, and then you can refine the mesh where you have uh, high gradients in your model. Uh, there are two kinds of mesh generation types. Uh, one is called structured mesh uh, generation. Uh, in that case, you have some kind of rule that defines the mesh. For example, you can have a, 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 a four-cornered geometry, and you say that that geometry should be divided up into um, rows and columns, for example. Uh, so you have a rule how to create the elements inside the geometry. Then you have unstructured mesh generation. Uh, here you have a geometry that is more general, and you ask the algorithm um, to fill the domain with elements. So basically, it, it, from a very uh, generic description, it will generate a lot of elements and fill that um, geometry with elements. Uh, however, those algorithms are often uh, limited to triangles or tetrahedral elements. Uh, there are some ways of, of generating quad elements and uh, other elements with high dimensions, but uh, often there are, you start with a triangle mesh or a tetrahedral mesh, which you then convert to to cord meshes. Uh, this is an example of a unstructured mesh. So here you can see you have a, in this case, you have a geometry here, a half circle. Uh, and then you just ask the, the algorithm to fill this space with uh, elements. And here you can have a criteria, for example, I want a certain number of elements here, a certain number of elements here. And if you try to uh, fulfill those uh, um, constraints on, on the mesh. You can also have a constraint that said these elements must be smaller in a certain area, and then it will generate as many elements as required to fulfill that criteria. Here's also a mesh here where you have a, a wing, which you want to analyze. So the, the domain you want to analyze in this is, case is uh, a fluid domain. And uh, so the mesh is actually describes the fluid domain, and then you have this boundary here for the wing. Here you can also see how here uh, they have uh, refined the mesh around the tip of the wing here because you uh, expect more high gradients here close to the tip. So it adds elements there. Uh, here you have structure meshes. And here you can see there is a rule here. So this is a, um, some kind of um, geometry here. And you can see here there are one, two, three, four, five sides. And you can see here there are you can describe with a number of elements in this direction, number of elements here, and it will generate those according to that rule. And here, a very simple one, uh, a box here with, with different number of elements in different dimensions. And here, here they are divided regularly, but it's also possible to uh, divide the mesh uh, irregularly. So you have different spaced uh, elements here in the structure mesh. And you can, even if you have a structured mesh, you can actually uh, build quite complicated meshes here. So this is a tunnel section. 
Um, here you build with uh, four uh, sided elements, uh, also called super elements sometimes, where you have an element here consists of uh, four curves in this case. Here you said I want a certain number of elements here, a number of here. And then you can connect them together, these super elements here. Uh, one important thing is that they have to be connected here. So they, the, the, the lines must be connected together. Uh, and then you connect more of them here uh, together to, to build a uh, structure. And sometimes structured elements can be uh, a good way to, to kind of have control over the mesh generation in more detail. You can, uh, here you can kind of refine around easily here, you can identify where the elements want to be uh, less uh, distance here, for example. Um, and it's almost like finite element on, on a super element level. In this course, we'll be using a mesh generator called GMSH, uh, which is a general uh, mesh generation application. Uh, it can generate meshes 1D, 2D, and 3D. There is also a pre and post processing application that we will not use in this course, but can also use to model geometry and create meshes. Uh, it can also generate both structured and unstructured meshes. And it, it uses a, a geometric description as input. So you define uh, nodes, lines, circles, splines, surfaces, combine them together to create a, uh, a domain. Uh, and that geometry is then used to create the mesh. And the geometry here is described in a special language. And uh, what we have done here is that we have integrated this into CalFEM. You don't have to generate uh, this special uh, geometry description that is handled completely by Carl Fem. So we use GMS as underlying the mesh generator. There are two modules that we'll be using. The Carl Fem dot geometry, which contains the, uh, a class called geometry, which you can add geometry to. Um, and then you have Carl Fem dot mesh, which is the mesh generator. And you, you provide Carl mesh here with the geometry, and it then gener generates uh, the core dot a dot what you know from Carl Um And here, the, this is a class here for mesh generator. Uh, and then what you get out is something that you will recognize from your small problem as well. So you get the e you get the cores, just that you get a lot more of them. So we will go do a small example here. I'll just move myself up here. So here you can see we, we define our domain. We have a slit here in a, in a domain. We have uh, the domain is defined by nodes. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Then we define uh, the line here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And those lines together. Uh, forms the surface. And that is the surface is what we are going to mesh. And here we also give some parameters here. So we have a height here for the height of the domain. We have a T here for the slit thick thickness. And also here we have V for the depth of the slit. And of course the width of the domain here as well. Those, uh, that, those of you that will do the groundwater assignment will probably recognize this model. So how do you start? So we load our modules here in Python. Uh, we have coffin.core, of course, that is the, our element functions. We load coffin.geometry as cfj, coffin mesh as cfm, and visualization routines with cfd. And then we also have some, some additional utilities here as cfu. So we load all those five modules, and of course we also need NumPy, so we load that as well here. So first we need to create some parameters for our model. So in this case here, I have set here W here to 100, height of 10, thickness of 1, and a depth of uh, height divided by 2. Uh, I create the identity matrix B here, element properties. And now we are ready to define our geometry. So the first thing I do is I create a geometry 
instance of geometry object from our geometry class here, which is in cfg.geometry. We now have a, we can look at the geometry as a container of a, a geometry, a ge geometric description. Uh, so now it's empty, there is no geometry. So we define it by just going through here. So g dot point, but we add a point. Uh, so this is point number zero, zero comma zero. And then we add points w because of the width. And we create the point here. We use, use all the time our uh, model parameters here. So we don't give any exact, except for the zero, zero. So now we have eight points defined. Next, we create our lines. In this case, we need to specify spline here because we can also have lines with that connects with uh, the three points. But spline here is zero, one, one to two, two to three. And then here is something special here. So if you want to provide boundary conditions on your model, you need a way to uh, query the generated elements uh, where they are in the geometric description. So by adding a marker option here, uh, all nodes that we belong to um, uh, this line here will be tagged with a number 80. Here. You can have any number here, that doesn't matter. But this will tag with 80 here. And you can later query for all elements uh, that is part of this line. Same thing here, we have marker t uh, 90 here. And this corresponds to, we go back here again, this for this to you. So uh, I think it was um, zero one three zero one zero one two. And this one here, and then this one here. So these lines here, I have no, marked them with a number here, so I can remember them later because we are going to apply boundary conditions on these two lines here. But then I know I, ca I can't specify boundary condition on a geometry. I need to specify boundary conditions on uh, degrees of freedom. And then finally here, we create our surface here. The G dot surface, and then we uh, add our, all of our lines that we defined now. And that will create the surface that we will use for meshing. So now we have a geometry description. Next step is to generate the mesh. So first I create some variable here that I, so element type three here, that is a quad element. Uh, and then I, uh, dots per node equals to one. That is in this case a temperature problem. So I have a scalar uh, degree of freedom here, so only one per node. I create a mesh object from our class here. So G mesh mesh generator. And then I provide input to this class here is the geometry. So you need to have a geometry to be able to mesh. So that, that you provide here. Then you can set element size factor here. So I want to have the um, biggest element should be 1.0 in the area. I specify the L type here, which should be uh, anything with that one. <coughs> So I give some, uh, this, these are uh, object attributes as we talk about later on, properties of the objects. Uh, so now I'm ready to kind of create a mesh. So what I do here then is I call mesh then create. And it returns you coordinates, so element coordinates, not geome geometric coordinates, element coordinates, element degrees of freedom, degrees of freedom per element node. And then you have a special one have this probably haven't seen before, B dots. Those are boundary degrees of freedoms. And you remember we set the marker for the geometry. This is a dictionary where the marker is the key. So if you want all the degrees of freedoms on a, on a certain geometry, 
to give it uh, the marker ID, and then you get all the degrees of freedom for that uh, geom geometry. Next, we assemble a problem. Now we have to think of it a little bit more. Uh, uh, we don't have an exact, we don't know the number of elements, so we need to query that. So we do n dots, uh, we do size here, then we get the number, uh, number of degrees of freedom. We create our element coordinate uh, arrays here using chord extra, e dot, chord so dot. And now we can create our stiffness matrix here using n p dot zeros, n dots, comma n dots. And then, just like you did before with the, the small problem, we loop over and do the assemblation. So, L top of ALX, ELY, and then we call our low element here, ELX, ELY, EP, and D, assemble this. Then we need to define our boundary conditions. So, first we create a force vector here, which is the same size of the also, I changed this. It's not good to do last minute changes here. So now I think we will talk about this of your exercises here that uh, we need to have two arrays for our boundary condition. One that contains the boundary conditions that are prescribed. So we create an empty array like this. We create a BC val here, empty array, empty here. But it's also one. Ah, today is very many errors today. That should be a float. Like that. So we have an uh, array with floats that contains the, the prescribed values. Uh, and then we do, there is a command called in the CFU that's called apply BC. That takes the boundary docs dictionary. And then you can see here you provide BC and BC val, which marker to assign, and the prescribed value. So in this case, I put zero on the marker 80, and we put 10 here on marker 90. And that, that command will modify the BC and BC val uh, arrays. And then we solve the problem. We give uh, A comma R here, solve it, K comma F comma B, boundary condition index array, boundary condition value array. And then we do Extract elements and displacements here, e dot comma a. Uh, we have a max flow array here to just uh, empty, and then we calculate our element forces, element flows, uh, as the max flow, uh, calculate max flow and add that to this array here. And then we can uh, do some uh, visualization here. So we can do draw geometry. That is a command that takes the geometry and just displays it in a map of the window. We have draw element values that uh, can draw element values in a, a color, each element with a single color here. So max flow, chords, e dot, dots per node, cal type. We have a draw mesh here, chords, e dot, dots per node, cal type. Uh, so that draws the mesh. And here have draw nodal values, a comma chords, e dot, dots per node. So this visualizes the uh, temperature field. And then we have some labels to this. And finally, we do throw and wait to enable it to display itself. And here are some examples how this can look. So this is the geometry generated. And you, we said we set the width of 100 here. So it goes from zero to 100. It's 10 meters high. And here you can see a slot here. And then you can see we, we set the zero value here on this side here. So this is the, uh, uh, the not the temperature, it's the, the, the pressure height to zero here and 10 here. 
So you can see here that red is 10, and then you have a, a transition over like this to zero here. And you can see also where the maximum flow is here. And then this slope here. So, um, you have already done this, so uh, you have to do this if you run this notebook here because I need Carl from Python in my Python notebook, so I do run this here. Okay, so the first thing uh, we'll do, we'll import our required Kotlin modules. And we will, we will do uh, um, add our points. And then, so this will be a rectangle here with uh, a circle inside. And here we say, say that we have a circle that is R size here. And we add the point here for the circle. And we add the lines for the outer part here. So I will skip here just to um, to solution here. So so here we will add circles. And the thing is that we need we can't do complete circles. We do we have to do half circles here. So in this case we do spline. Oh no, sorry, I copied the wrong thing here. There, there's a circle command here. Here. So here I have a circle from uh, five, four, and seven. So seven, that is the um, rectangle. So uh, I'm, I'm look at the documentation here, but it will add four half circles here to the, to the mesh. And finally here, I do the surface here. So I give the outer surface, and then you can specify the so second parameter is actually holes. So you can say that this, the lines that you add later will be a hole in the structure. So the first one is the outer structure, and this is the uh, a list of holes. And then we run this here. And so you can see here that I have, uh, I have a circle here, circle here, half circle here, and circle. So you, you define the circles by specifying uh, three points here with a Points. So if I change the radius here, for example, to 20, you can see I get, I get a smaller circle here. So now I have the geometry. I, I can generate the mesh. So here I can do the mesh generators here with the D as input. I specify some parameter here, two here for triangles, cross by node one, element size factor here. And then we, we create our topology and we draw our mesh here. So we'll just show some how the parameters can vary here. So if I run this now, you can see here I get the uh, element mesh that will, will have a hole in the middle. So you can almost see it, it, many of these algorithms, they start from the outer ring here and fill up to the inside. And also it will uh, start at the edges here. So it will start from the outer and inner and fill up the entire structure. So suppose I wanted to have less elements. I can change here to 0 0.05. Now you can see you have less elements. I can also do element type three for quad elements. And then you can see here that it creates uh, quad elements. Um, the strange artifacts here is because it 
it uses a triangle mesh from the beginning and then it combines that to a quad mesh later on. So it, it combines two triangle elements to, to one single quad element. And I can, of course, also um, try a higher density quad mesh. So like this. So it's a quite powerful tool. You have to be a bit careful. It can generate a lot of elements. So if you put uh, too uh, small value on the max element size, it will generate millions of elements, no problems. The problem is that you'll, you'll have a problem with a solver later on that it can't solve the problem. <clears throat> so here, here's an example here. This is a, a code in, in Visual Studio Code. So this is not a notebook. And here you can see uh, some examples. And also, please look at the, if you go to the Carlton web or the Carlton GitHub site, uh, there is a lot of examples here that you can use uh, as a base for your code. So uh, don't hesitate to look there. There are there are a lot of things that are useful for this programming course. So here we define a geometry, and here you can see that we define a lot of different element types. We can define ellipses. You can do splines here. Here's also a spline with multiple uh, points. We add a surface here, and you can see here we have our holes here. So seven, five, six, zero. Those, uh, so seven here is, is one uh, element, and then five, six, zero is the other ones that we want to have as a hole. We create a mesh again here, mesh object. We set up attributes, DOS per node, L size factor generate a mesh, <clears throat> and then we, we plot it here. And here you can also see there are some other features that you can do. You can add some text to the uh, plot as well. Here you can see the, the underlying geometry and the different uh, lines and spines we draw, drew. Uh, and here you can see the generated element. And now you can see it's not very good here. So I think we need to improve the element size here to get something a bit better. So we go up here and we set 005 like that. We'll run it again. Now you can see the resolution is a bit better here. It's more smooth here. I can also show you here, if we look at the... Uh, let's print out the boundary DOPS vector here just to see how it looks. Okay, it looks strange. Um, And now I can see it better here. Let's see. So if you look at this boundary, you can see here there's a dictionary here. So 50 here is a marker, marker key. Then you can see all the degrees of freedom that are connected to this boundary. And those you can use later on to assign boundary conditions. And you can see here there's a dictionary of 80 here. And you can see a, li a list of all the boundary degrees of freedom that are associated with this boundary uh, marker. So this is a very uh, nice data structure to have if you want to assign boundary conditions. So let's see here, we can go to 
Another example here. Uh, so this is a plane stress problem. It looks something like then you have lower here. And we're gonna produce a boundary condition here as well. So you have here um we define our main problem variables here, uh, thickness, Poisson's ratio, elasticity module. Uh, P-type is for plain stress. I create an element property uh, list here. I create the constituency uh, matrix D. And then I define uh, some points here. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't explain exactly, but this is a parametric description here. And it can, can Raise the points. Then it loops over here to create all these points, it creates all these splines. And here you can see we set markers here uh, to different uh, uh, different parts of the geometry. Uh, here is the circle arcs are defined here. A structure surface here with um, multiple domains. We create the mesh here. Uh, create a mesh object, what, what element type we want. In this case, it's a stress problem. So we have two degrees of freedom per node. So we provide two here. And we do the same thing here, assemble, um, just like you have shown you done in your, your example. Uh, create our force vector, boundary conditions, apply BC for boundary conditions, but there is also apply force. And then we solve this equation system, um, calculate our uh, forces, and then we do the visualization. And for some reason, all these windows always appear on the back of my screen. So this is a structured element measure. So you can see uh, all these super elements that you can connect together. Uh, and you see all these half surface here to create this example. Uh, you also see the different namings here. Then we have uh, the mesh. We have the displacements. So you can draw the undisplaced um, geometry here and the displaced geometry uh, on top of each other here in this card. And we can also show the von Mises stresses here as well. So as the final part here, I will uh, try to convert um, one of these examples into this model that you are doing here to just kind of uh, illustrate how you go from a, a sequential algorithm that solves everything into, into three classes, the model params class, the model solver, and the model results. So we'll do kind of a complete example that will convert an existing example to a model-based example. So let's see here we can find this. So just to illustrate here, I will try to okay, go this side. So 
So what, what we will do in the course is that we will have uh, in your assignment, we will have uh, one class that is called model parents. And you will also have a class that is called uh, model result. And you will have a class that is the, the solver part. And that class takes a model params as input and a model results as output. So it will take the parameters from a model parent instance and store them in a model result. You will also have a model uh, visualization. I just tried to model this. And that will read results from the model parents to, no, to get the, sorry, then to get the model parameters, but also use the model result here to do a visualization. And the idea here is that um, if you want to do a param parameter study of, of your uh, the problem, you can create multiple of these. Same thing with the model result, you have one per result. And you can we can have a loop, we can loop around these here. And feed them in each loop, we can have different parameter sets that gives you a second model result as well. Uh, and then also the user interface will modify these parameters and we'll also use this to do the visualization. So what I was thinking about now is to just illustrate how you can go from, uh, so I have here a model example here, which is a single source code file that solves a problem. You can see all the variable, are just like you do in MATLAB, you just define them uh, and then run them. So if I, if I run this here, I have a temperature problem here, uh, and I have a mesh here and a geometry. And I want to combine this into the this the structure I showed here. So let's see here. So you can see here I created all my classes here. I have a temp model parent class here. Uh, now I'm showing you something strange here. What does that mean? So pass is uh, the most useful, well, not useless command in Python. It does absolutely nothing. But Python can't have an empty block. So you always have to have something in a block, otherwise it's not syntactically correct. So if you put pass here, the def init function will be created containing nothing for a class statement. So this way you can you can sketch up your classes without actually doing any implementation of your stuff. That's why I create an empty model parents. I create an empty model results class. And I, I name them here, temp here, because I want them to be a simulate temperature. I have a temp, temp model solver here that will be solver. And you can see you have model parents, model results as input. I store them internally here. Uh, and then the same thing, model visualization, model params, model results, and I store them internally like this. And I, I will simplify this a bit more. So you can implement this all with properties, but I will not do this in, in this example here. So I will just store them as attributes that are publicly accessible. And you can see the solver will have a execute method here. So here I will do my uh, simulation. Uh, and the visualization part will have a show geometry, show temperature, and a show mesh. Yes. Um, 
we get an extra point. <laughs> um, yes. So the first thing I will do is uh, I will transfer over some of the parameters from the main function. So in this case here, I have, um, what do we have here? We have um, this, this stuff here. Um, I will not transfer over these ones here. So these are parameters that are um, not something that we can create from other um, other variables. So these are standalone. EP can always be created from the existing parameters. Uh, so I will not transfer that over. And I will move these later on to the uh, execute part of the solver instead, because these can be created on the fly. So I will just create, um, I will take this over. And I go here, and I will go put them in here. Now I have to make sure that they are indented to that code block. And this is not enough because, as you see here, these are local variables. So when this model, this is, uh, if you create a class like this, it will execute this, but they will not be stored together with the object. So we need to add the self uh, attribute in front of here. Self dot So now I have a set of parameters. Oh, we have the gate gun, forgot this one. Like this. We have the self there as well. Like that. Uh, so next we will uh, also move some of the stuff from the so this part here will be added to the execute method. Uh, I will let this also go in there. So we go into our solver here. Like this. And now you can see uh, which should still code complains that there are T and N are unknown. So what I do do here in the beginning here, I do uh, T equals to model self and do N equals to self dot model. N. So I reference them uh, because these will reference the same memory location as for the self model params T. So now I can use T and N. This is and I can also add the other ones here, the kx1 equals to self dot model params dot kx1. And then we do, we have four of these. So now I have local references of these. So I don't have to handle it later. And I can create a D1 and D2 matrices like this. That should be K, KY2, last row. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Spares me some errors. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I would also add here, so I will do a single code program here. So in, in the end here, I will do if uh name equals to main here so this is my main program so now we'll, we'll do the uh, create a model params object equals to temp model params like this um so that is the first object i create uh, model result we can actually keep it empty for now so uh uh, in, in your example, you, you uh, added some non variables in that clause, but you can actually keep it completely empty and we can fill it later uh, by the solver. So next step, I will add more stuff to the to the temperature solver here. So I will just continue here. No, I forgot one thing. So we need to, in our input, we will also need to provide a geometry. 
So the geometry uh, creation here, I will move into the input param, uh, the model, in, model params class. So I just copy all of this over here. And now I, I will do something that is a little bit uh, interesting here. So I will do at property. If I can spell property, um, def geometry self So now I have a geometry property. The only thing missing now is actually I actually have to um, return something from this method as well. So we will do return G like this. So what I can do now is actually something like this. Print model params dot geometry. So it's not a function, it will generate um, a geometry for me if I can code correctly. So you can see here that it returns uh, a geometry object. So this is very useful if I want to model here. So uh, my parameters will automatically give, you, give me a geometry for my parameters. So if you have a parametric geometry, you can have a property that when you want the geometry, it will always generate one for you, depending on the parameters. I think we'll do a 15 minute break and then we I finished off the examples after. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so now we are starting on our execute method, and uh, I'm going to continue here to move over stuff from the uh, my model routine here that I don't want to will be include as classes. So let's see here if I go in here. So now I have a method of getting the geometry. So next I will uh, do the assemblation here. So I will create a meshed object. I will copy over the solution stuff here as well. Let's keep the visualization here because I, the visualization I want to have separate. And then I will end this here. And now I have to indent it as well. So uh, what I need now is the, uh, I will also need um, to, to get a hold of the geometry now to be do the mesh. You can see here that it has a squiggly thing here that it doesn't know about this variable. So now we'll use my newly created property. So self dot model params dot geometry. So every time I want to solve the problem, it will query the model parameters to gener uh, to generate the model uh, uh, to generate the geometry for me. So that's why if you change a parameter in the model params when you do the solution, it will always have an up to date geomet geometric model. Um, here also are some element types here. I create my mesh uh, and I solve the problem here. So now I have all these local result variables that I need to take care of somehow. So what I now I'm going to cheat a bit. So I have a finished example here. So I will copy over some of the stuff I added here at the end here. To be able to, to do visualization and reporting, I need to get the results out of my solver. So that I, I'm doing here. So 
I gave it, I gave my silver a model results object. So now I just attach variables to this. So this is also a nice thing, thing with Python is that you actually, you saw that we have a model results that are completely empty. When I do this, it will add an attribute. So we attach A to results. So basically you can, you can see this as a container that we can attach a lot of references to. And uh, we give it A, R, E, D, because we need to visualize some of the stuff. So we need some things from the mesh generation. So we also provide with cores, feed off, and we also just in a convenience way, we add the mesh object to the output here. Then we can get a lot of other attributes out from that one that we can use for visualization for it. So now we have actually a, a complete solver. So what I can do now is I will do a model results, create a new object here so I can store my results. Uh, I can skip this print because I don't need that. Now I create a model solver. And now I have to give it model params. So I passed my objects over to the solver, model results, like this. And now I can do model uh, solver execute. So if everything goes well, it should run now. And it did. So now I have you see here, it did the meshing, uh, it sold the system, and it stored the results in the more results. So what we can do is we can look at uh, what what is in the, I think I could do, This is a bit, so what I did with the dear function here is just to plot it all the attributes of, my, uh, of this um, object. And you can see here that now we have course, ed, edof, and mesh, and r, stored in this model here. So you, you can see it as an object that can hold results. The, the model solver itself uh, doesn't uh, store these. It's, it's your own objects that have the results. So finally, we need to implement our uh, visualization as well. You can see also the visualization object also takes the model params and model results. And we start with a geometry. Just copy this over here and add it to this part here, indent. And now we also need a way of uh, uh, when you run this standalone, we need to set uh, weight, uh, show and weight. So we actually, just for convenience here, we we add this function here, show and weight in our own class here. In that way, the user of the temp visualization class doesn't have to know about the CFV show and weight. He just have to know about the show and weight method here. So CFV.show and weight, like this. Now we create a model this model params model results. We can do model this show geometry. Hopefully it should show you us the geometry now. Oh, the G was not defined. Yeah, now you see here that we need to model self of model uh, results, no, model params dot geometry. So it, because uh, this code was referencing local variables, uh, we need to specify that it should use uh, the self dot things here. So let's try it again. And now we've got the geometry. 
And then we can do the temperature. And we can take the mesh first. Draw mesh. Move it over, put it here. And now you can see here as well that we need to do self.model results. And we do that for all of these here. And now we can also use the, we passed over the mesh thing here. So we can do, uh, instead of model results, we do like this uh, mesh. We'll do it a bit more readable here. Like this. Hopefully that should work. Oh, I closed too quickly. Can you see the error here? I copy and pasted the wrong meth method. This should work. So now I have a mesh and this one. And then we also finally, we take the, the geometry part here, or the monodal values here as well. Oh, it didn't call. We need also to do the model. Like this. So now we have a complete object-oriented planet element program and with a lot of flexibility as well. So I think one of the beauties of object oriented program is that you can create stuff like this, very compact, uh, very readable, uh, you know, I mean, solve or execute, it takes the input and output, it hides a lot of stuff for you, but it creates an in easy interface to use with your planet element solver. And what I'm going to do now is just going to show you how you very easily can do a parametric solver. So for example here, instead of defining my Params like this, I will do a loop. So let's see here if we can do, is there any parameter we can vary here? We can vary, um, let's see, kx and ky or something. What do we set them to as initial? So let's see, kx1 uh, range. MP dot lean space. Let's say we do from uh, hundred or ten point zero to one hundred in twenty steps like this. Then I can do. I create also a model uh, models. I create an empty list for. Um, value in kx1 range. 
I create. I create one model params per iteration step like this. And I do um, set here model params dot kx1 equals to value. And I do models append uh, model params. I have to name it a bit. I'll we'll do it parameters results. Yes. So now I just create an empty uh, results value here because I uh, will store results from that parameter in a separate list here. Uh, and now I can do like this, so four, um, see params. Uh, I think I can do like this. I just comment this this part out here for the moment. So what I have now is uh, uh, I create an empty uh, I create a parameter set for each uh, range here. So this will be basically twenty temp model params and twenty temp model results. Uh, I for each loop, I set a different value here over my parents model, I append it to, and then I loop over here to solve my problem. The solver is completely unaware that I did this looping. So it just takes some objects and uses that for the solution. So now I am doing this live. Hopefully it will, yeah. Did you see what happens now? It solves the problem 20 times. So you see it iterated around and uh, let's see, we can just print out here, uh, print. I'm not sure if I, um, yeah, it's very hard to show what's actually varying here, but uh, um, model results. Let's just take one um, like that. Of course, you can't see it now when it goes so quickly. <laughs> we can do a, a loop here. After the sol solution here, we can do for result in results like this. Then we should be able to perhaps see some variation in, in the results here. Yeah, it actually worked. So you can see here, I changed the KX value of the, the um, Conductivity here, and then you can see here that I just picked one degree of freedom here and just printed out the temperature here. Then you can see it change, changed. So by using this, uh, by dividing up the parameters and the results in different classes, you can very easily do a parameter study.
uh, it's kind of uh, Lego blocks that you can plug together. Um, well, as I, because I store here results in this results variable, and I provide result parameter results here. So the solver will store the, read the results from read the input from parameter and store the result in results. Uh, and as this is part of the list here, uh, you will get there. You can look over the results later on here and get any parameter for, for that uh, change uh, input parameter. And you will also do this in in uh, in some in, in the coming worksheets. So the next worksheet will contain a parameter study, and that's why we are dividing up the problem like this. Yep. Uh, should we do a mesh for the assignment? So, so for the, the turn in tomorrow, that is no no mesh generation. So that is a handmade mesh. Uh, and then for the next worksheets, there will be a you will do it a mesh from a geometry. And then after that, we will start with the user interface part. Okay, I'm I'm done for today. Any questions?